the rapture, uh, the first one being post-tribulation rapture, pre-tribulation rapture is the second one, and then mid-tribulation rapture, and then the pre-wrath rapture. So those who are not familiar with these terms, please refer to our previous episodes of the Bible History Project. Now we know all of these different views, they have their strengths and they also have their weaknesses. And many have asked us, Brother John, what is the stand of the assembly? What are we believing here? What are we adopting here? Is it post-tribulation? Is it pre-tribulation? Is it mid-tribulation? Or is it pre-wrath? What do you think our answer is? I think the answer and the stand of the assembly is none of the above. And we're going to show you the reason behind that. However, as students of the Holy Scriptures, the one thing we need to continue to do is to study the Holy Bible. And in our decision to study the Holy Bible, the more we learn, the more we need to adjust our beliefs because we are in this journey together. What I learned is what I shared with you. And so after looking at these different rapture views, we're going to examine the content of the book of Revelation and kind of test out ideas here and there so that we can come up with our own conclusion based upon the Holy Scriptures concerning what we believe during the end times and the events that lead up to the day of our salvation. Now, of course, the most prominent view uh, is the post-tribulational rapture because pre-tribulation did not really come until about the 1900s during the ad when Darby, one of the Bible scholars, presented the idea of pre-tribulation for the, for the most part, part of Christian history, they believed in post-tribulation rapture. It's only recently when we have the pre, the mid, and the pre-wrath uh, tribulation rapture view. And so there's a difference essentially between the post-tribulation rapture and the pre, the mid, and the pre-wrath tribulation rapture. And one of the fundamental differences, something that we're going to go over tonight, is the idea presented by the post-tribulation rapture, which basically says the rapture and the second coming are one. Amen. And so this is really similar to what is adopted by the Iglesia de Cristo, because according to the Iglesia de Cristo, uh, when Yahusha comes back, the second advent, that's when we are resurrected, that's when we are caught up into the clouds, and then we go to heaven. Post-tribulation rapture, on the other hand, believes that when we meet Yahusha in the air, we're not going straight to heaven yet, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Nonetheless, the INC stand and the post-tribulation stand is the rapture and the second coming are one event. And so they kind of meet in the middle, we go to uh, Jerusalem or to heaven, as the case may be. On the other hand, the pre, the mid, the pre-wrath tribulation rapture, they believe the rapture and the second coming are two, not one, but two distinct events. So when we look at the following slide, this is the, trip, the pre, the mid, and the pre-wrath view of the rapture. We have the pre-trib. They believe that the rapture will take place before the seven-year tribulation. The mid-trib view, uh, they believe that the rapture is going to take place at the middle of the tribulation. And the pre-wrath view, when the, the, uh, the rapture will take place at the end of the sixth seal of the book of Revelation. So those are your pre-trib, mid-trib, and pre-wrath views. And in comparison, uh, the, the post-tribulation view, they believe the second coming, and the rapture, all take place in one event. So one of the most glaring weaknesses of the pre, the mid uh, tribulation and pre-wrath tribulation rapture views is the belief that there is no biblical evidence that the rapture and the second coming are two distinct events. Personally, based upon the study of the Holy Scriptures, I believe there are many evidences that there, the rapture and the second advent or the second coming of our King Yahusha, when he lands on earth, I believe are two very distinct events. And what biblical evidences do we have to prove that they are indeed two separate and distinct events? Well, in the book of Leviticus, the Bible tells us about Yahuwah's appointed feast. We talk about the Moedim in great length. When it says feast, we know the Bible speaks of the Moed, Moedim, which means appointed time. 
and we study Bimoidim in our past Bible History Project lessons, even during our worship services, and there are seven appointed times, right? Do you still remember the seven appointed times, the Moedim? We studied in great length the first four just recently, which is Passover, Unleavened Bread, um, and then the Feast of First Fruits, and then Pentecost. Remember the first Moedim, the first appointed uh appointed uh, days or appointed feasts of Yahuwah, we studied it and we know that Yahusha did something on those appointed days. This is why it's called Moedim. It's an appointed time, meaning Yahusha will do something at that appointed time. And when we go to Colossians chapter 2, 16 to 17, Apostle Paul confirms, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So Apostle Paul speaking about the Moedim, the festivals, he says the following, they are the shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Now there are those who say we should no longer observe the Moedim because Yahusha has already come. But when you think about this passage, it's actually telling us something different. Because Apostle Paul says, the substance is Christ and the shadow are the festivals. And so what this tells us is we need to use the Moedim, the festivals of Yahuwah, as memorials, looking back and being thankful and grateful for what Yahuwah has done for his people over the history of, re of redemption, redemptive history. However, when you think about it, it says Yahusha is the substance, uh, uh, the Bible says the, the festivals is the substance, the, festi the substance of the festivals is of Christ. And when you look at the Greek, it's actually the body. The body is of Christ. And when you think of a body, like the human body, right? When a person faces east and the sunrise, sun rises, where is your shadow falling? It's behind you, right? And then when your sun, when the sun passes you and it goes to, towards the sunset, where's the shadow being cast? Forward. So sometimes the shadow is backward. Sometimes the shadow is forward. So what Apostle Paul is saying is when Yahushua is the purpose of the Moedim and Yahushua is also the, where we need to place our sights when it comes to the events of the future, because Yahusha is not only the foreshadowing of the types, he is also the source of our rehearsals because he will do something in the future that has not yet been done. He will follow the pattern of the Moedim. So Yahusha will not break, but he will fulfill the Moedim for the appointed times. So now there are seven appointed times. First one is Passover. When did this take place? On the 14th of the first month. And then this was followed the day after, the 15th day of the first month. And then the Feast of First Fruits is on the, fifth, uh, the day after the Sabbath, after the Passover of the first month. And the Feast of Weeks is the 50th day from the first fruits. And so this happened, the first three festivals happened on the first month, right? And then there was like a, a waiting period of about 50 days. On the 50th day from the first fruits, that's when you celebrate the Feast of Weeks, which we recently observed and celebrated. It's also called Pentecost. And we know not only did Yahuwah did great events for his people Israel, because the Moedim that we find here, this is for the people of Israel, but Yahusha will also fulfill this Moedim. So it has an application for Israel, which took place in the Old Testament, but it also has an application for those who belong to our king, Yahushua. And we know Yahushua fulfilled the Moedim precisely. For example, on the 14th day of the first month, what did Yahushua do? Died, right? On the 15th day of the first month, what did Yahushua do? He was in the grave. And on the Feast of First Fruits, what did Yahushua do? Yahusha was presented as the first fruit offering. And on the Feast of Weeks, what did Yahusha do? He gave the gift of the Holy 
spirit. So we know that Yahushua did something that correspond to the Moedim or appointed times. And so when we look at the first four feasts and the fulfillment of our King Yahushua, we can say that the first coming of Yahushua has one, two, three, four phases. Four phases in what can be considered the first coming of Yahushua. So when Yahushua came here, he did not execute judgment, did he? When he first came here, he came here to die, to be buried, to be resurrected, so that he can send the Spirit to empower his bride or the ecclesia. And so that's the first advent, the first coming of our King, Yahushua. And so what do you suppose the next three feasts or Moedim or appointed time correspond to? Of course, if we do the logic, Bible logic, what do you think the three feasts in the fall correspond to the second coming of our king Yahushua. You notice the second coming of our king Yahushua is not just one phase. How many phases does it have? Three, right? Three phases corresponding to the Feast of Trumpets and then the Day of Atonement and then the Feast of Tabernacles. So let's go ahead and take a look at these distinct festivals of Yahuwah and try and figure out what it corresponds to as far as the work that Yahusha will do. Because if our King Yahusha in the past fulfilled the first four feasts, then it's likely, highly likely, that he will not break Moedim now, that he will continue to follow Moedim or the appointed time that was set forth by Abba Yahuwah Elohim. So let's go ahead and examine the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is also called the Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah. And when is it celebrated or observed? Let's go to Leviticus 23, 23, 25. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. So when is the celebration of what is called Yom Teruah, or the Feast of Trumpets? It is on the first day of the seventh month. And this is the feast which will kick off the other two feasts. So basically, when this feast is celebrated, it's like it sets up the other two. And when this feast is celebrated, what is done on that day? A blowing of trumpets. And when is this celebrated? On the first day of the month. Which month? It is the first day of the seventh month. And so on the first day of the seventh month, there is a blowing of trumpets. Now, what is the significance of the blowing of trumpets? The Bible says, one of its significances is to serve as a memorial because Yahuwah, when he was in the mountain, there was a blowing of trumpets, a display of his power and his glory and the giving of the command. So that's one way we kind of, rem one of the things we remember when the, the trumpets are blown. What also are the purposes of the blowing of trumpets? In the book of Numbers 10, 8 to 10, the sons of Aaron, the priests are to blow the trumpets. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you and the generations to come. When you're going to battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpet. So that's one. It's like a battle cry. Then you will be remembered by Yahuwah your God and, rescue, and rescued you from uh, your enemies. Also, at your times of rejoicing, your appointed peace, and new moon festivals, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellow offerings, and they will be a memorial to you before your God. I am Yahuwah, your God. So what are some of the purposes of the blowing of trumpets? One, it's a battle cry. Two, it's also to celebrate the new moon festivals and the appointed feasts. And when we blow the trumpets, the Bible says God will remember us. But there's also another uh, significant purpose of the blowing of trumpets. What is that? Joel 2 verse 1, blow the trumpet, sound the alarm on Zion, 
God's sacred hill, tremble, people of Judah, the day of Yahuwah is coming soon. Now, we're going to study later on all about the day of Yahuwah. People usually, usually call this the day of the Lord because it's significant in our study of the rapture and end time events. One of the purposes of the blowing of the trumpet is to alarm Israel, to alarm the people of Yahuwah, that what is coming near? The day of Yahuwah. And so people need to be prepared. This is why when we look at the book of Leviticus, when we read about the blowing of trumpets, right? This is on the first day of the seventh month. This is actually in preparation for what, for the next festival to be observed. What is that? In Leviticus 23, 26 to 31, and Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, also the 10th of this seventh, seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Yahuwah your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul, on that same day shall be cut off from his people. This is why the day of atonement is also called a day of judgment for the people of Israel because on the day of atonement the high priest gets to enter the most holy place and perform a sacrifice for the sake of the sins of the people and so when the people are not afflicted if they're not repenting what's going to happen to them they're going to be cut off in other words they're going to be judged by Yahuwah and so when the blowing of trumpets took place on Yom Teruah, on the Feast of Trumpets. It's actually a signal for the people of Israel to begin repenting, repenting, because it's going to lead to the Day of Judgment, which is called the Day of Atonement. Now, the blowing of trumpets, what significance or connection does it have with the work of Yahushua? We've looked at the work of Yahuwah in the, first, in the Old Testament, concerning uh, the, the uh, Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. How about during the Christian era? What is its purpose? What will Yahushua do? Well, let's read the book of Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so when this event takes place, what is this event again? The catching up of those who belong to Yahusha in the air to meet Yahusha there. What is that event? Arpazo, which means the rapture. What will signal the coming of the rapture? There's going to be a blowing of a trumpet. There's going to be a shout from heaven. And so when this shout is heard, when this trumpet is blown, what will happen? There's going to be the rapture or the harpazo. And so the blowing of trumpets, it has some connection with the rapture or the harpazo where those who belong to Yahusha are going to meet him in the air. And what is this trumpet called? And what will happen to those who meet Yahushua in the air? Corinthians 15, 50 to 53. Now, this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And so when the harpazo takes place, when the trumpet is sounded, what will happen to us? We're going to meet Yahusha in the air. The Bible says we're going to be changed physically changed it's a transformation and it's a mystery because it's going to take place 
in the twinkling of an eye. Now, what does that mean? That's basically telling us we're going to be instantaneously changed really fast. What kind of body are we going to possess? A body that is incorruptible, a body that is immortal. What does that mean? It no longer perishes. It no longer dies. It's a body that will last forever. Why? Because our King Yahushua is going to take us to heaven. And in heaven, a person cannot enter heaven unless, of course, our bodies are physically transformed. So this tells us there's a purpose for the rapture. The purpose for the harpazo is not only to take us to where Yahushua is at, but to prepare our body so that we can enter heaven. And this is why this will take place at the trumpet. What trumpet is Apostle Paul referring to here? He says, at the last trumpet. Okay, so at the last trumpet, there's going to be the harpazo, and there's going to be the change in our physical body. Now, in what else are the trumpets associated with? In the book of Matthew, 24, 30 to 31, 36, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So the Bible is speaking again about an event that is going to take place after the blowing of a trumpet. It is the gathering of the people who will be taken to the Son of Man, who is Yahusha, coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so we can see here that Apostle Paul and our King Yahusha associates the blowing of a trumpet with what? The rapture event when we go to Yahusha in the clouds, having our bodies transformed. However, for us to understand this, we need to understand some idioms, Hebrew idioms associated with the rapture. There's a lot of confusion sometimes when we read the scriptures without an understanding of the Hebrew idioms, because you have to keep in mind our King Yahusha, he was Hebrew. The apostles are Hebrew. When they wrote the scripture, the primary audience were Hebrew. And so oftentimes when Yahushua spoke and when the apostles wrote, they employed Hebrew idioms. And so for us to properly understand the teachings we find in the Holy Bible, we need to be well versed when it comes to Hebrew idioms. There are cer certain Hebrew idioms that we just read that is associated with the rapture. For example, in, Cor in Corinthians, also, Paul mentions the last trump, the last trumpet. And our King Yahusha mentions the day and hour no one knows, right? And so these are examples of Hebrew idioms associated with the rapture. So let's look at these two Hebrew idioms. The first one, the last trump, and number two, the day and hour no one knows. What is the last trump all about? You still remember, on the first day of the seventh month, which is the Feast of Trumpets, there's going to be what? A blowing of trumpets. And so what does that mean? There's going to be a blowing of trumpets. The blowing of trumpets on the day of the Feast of Trumpets, it's different from a regular blowing of trumpets because throughout Israel, they always blow trumpets. But there's a big distinction between a regular blowing of trumpets and the trumpets are blown on the day of Teruah, on the Feast of Trumpets. We have to remember, on the Feast of Trumpets, there are four kinds of blowing of trumpets. What are those four kinds? Well, there's the Tekiah, the Shevarim, and then the Teruah. Okay? The Tekiah is one long straight blast. The Shevarim are three short blasts. The Teruah well, there are nine quick blasts in short succession. Each blast are blown three times, then repeated 11 times, which totals 99 shofar blasts. And then there is the Tekiyah Gedola. So after blowing all those different kinds of trumpets, there's one final blast. What is that called? Tekiyah Gedola, which represents 
the last trump. And so when Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.50, where when he spoke about the transformation of our bodies from a corruptible body to an incorruptible one, it is started by this last trump, which is the day of trumpets. And so there seems to be good biblical evidence that the Feast of Trumpets corresponds to Yahusha's work of taking the Ecclesia and meeting and the Ecclesia meeting with, with him in the air. This is why the rapture event corresponds to the blowing of trumpets or to the Feast of Trumpets. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the second idiom. That day and hour, no one knows. Now, what is that referring to? Did you know in Israel, Yom Teruah is the only holiday, the only festival that lasts for two days. Both days are considered one long day of 48 hours. This is why when you go to the internet and look at Yom Teruah in Israel, it will give you two dates. That's because it was customary uh, during the days of the Old Testament before one can determine Yom Teruah, there's a process that you have to go through. What is that process? Why do we need that process? Why do they have to follow those steps? Well, the Feast of Trumpets is the only feast that is marked not by a day, a date, or a time. Rather, it's marked by a sign in the heavens. You notice the Passover is on the 14th, right? And then on the 15th, and then the Day of Atonement is on the 10th, and then the Feast of Trumpets on the 15th, I mean, Feast of the Tabernacles on the 15th of some month, and the 14th and 15th of some month. But when it comes to the Feast of Trumpets, it doesn't, it's not really marked by a day or a date or a time, but a sign in the heavens. What is that sign? The book of Psalms 81, verse 3. Now, the, the ram's horn, the shofar, at the new moon, and when the moon is full on the day of our Feast. And so the sign in the heavens, the Bible tells us to look at when it comes to determining when Yom Teruah and the blowing of trumpets begins is the moon. And so when you look at the moon, you have, it's, that's when you determine when it's time to blow the trumpets. So if it's a new moon, that's the first day of the month. So once you determine the first day of the month, you can now determine the 15th day of that month. You get it? But unless and until you determine the first day of that month, well, you cannot really know uh, the rest of the festivals and the fall festivals. So you need to identify the new moon of the seventh month. Now, of course, to determine that, you, got, you have to look up there. You have to look at the cosmos. You have to look at the, the moon itself, right? And who's going to look at it? And... What's the process like? Well, in the Old Testament, in order to establish a matter legally or officially, there had to be two witnesses. One witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so what happened during the Old Testament times is there were two reliable witnesses who observe the moon and when they notice it is the new moon then they inform uh, the high priest or the king or whoever and they will make an official announcement concerning when the feast of trumpets begins and so that was happening throughout the old testament time and during the day of yahusha which is the first century when yahusha was here on earth the Sanhedrin, of course, was the body that determined officially the start of Yom Teruah. And during the time of Yahushua in the first century, the Sanhedrin required two witnesses to tell them when the new moon arrived. Once a month, the Sanhedrin discussed when to proclaim the new moon. They did this through the agency of two witnesses, the element of all legal transactions in Judaism. That was based on Deuteronomy which I just read to you a while ago. So there are two witnesses. These two witnesses, what are they going to do? They look at the moon. And so just before the moon's disk enters total darkness, 
or waning crescent. There are tiny slivers of white on its edges. These are the horns of the moon. After correctly sighted, the horns determine the beginning of the new month. Once the two witnesses were qualified and questioned, if the president of the Sanhedrin, who knew astronomy, most of them anyways, according to history, was convinced that their observation was accurate, he publicly sanctified the start of the new month. So this was the process of determining um, when Yom Teruah started. They sent out qualified witnesses. These are not just any person that they select. Uh, it took quite some time to determine people who fit the qualifications. They have to have integrity, they are well respected, they are faithful. These are not just anyone, but highly qualified individuals. And then what they do is they observe the moon, and once they begin to observe the moon, and it and they, it, they, they can see the horns of the moon, then they will report to the Sanhedrin, and the president of the Sanhedrin, he will make a declaration. And what is that declaration? Well, after scrutiny to determine the official arrival of the new moon, the president proclaimed the new moon with the word sanctified. And all the people repeated after him, sanctified, sanctified. After the proclamation, the Sanhedrin ordered watchmen on the nearby hillside to light fires and thus inform the Jews in all of Judea, Samaria, Egypt, Babylon, and beyond that the new month had begun. This started the festival of the new moon and the counting of the next 29 days to the subsequent new month proclamation. So there was a, a long process that was involved, right, when it comes to determining the new moon. The problem is the new moon, which is the first day of this seventh month, if it's the seventh month, that's also the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the Feast of Tabernacles, it turns out it's a Sabbath. But the people did not know when to celebrate that because they don't know, they haven't heard the announcement. So before they can begin celebrating, they need to first receive the announcement, the proclamation that it's already time to celebrate the new moon. This is why it came to be known as the festival, right, that has no day or hour. The Feast of Trumpets is traditionally known as the feast for the day and hour no one knows. Because if you were to ask them, okay, when's the Feast of Tabernacles? Oh, they know. It's the 15th. When is the Feast of Day of Atonement? Oh, they know. It's the 10th. When is the Feast of Trumpets? Well, they don't know. They allow the, the day or hour because they have to wait for the proclamation from the Sanhedrin before they can say, okay, it is now time to celebrate. And so they were dependent on the proclamation of others, the witnesses, the two witnesses, before they knew it was time to celebrate Yom Teruah. And so that's where you have the idiom, the day and hour no one knows. So when we look at the Hebrew idioms associated with the rapture, the last trump, and the day and hour no one knows, what does that point to? The feast of trumpets. This is why there is good biblical evidence that on the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of the seventh month, what will Yahusha do on that day? Yahusha is going to take the ecclesia to heaven. What do we call this? The rapture or the arpatso. And so if that's going to take place on the first day of the seventh month, Yom Teruah, well, how about the tenth day of the seventh month? The day of atonement. What happens on the day of atonement. But before we go there, you know, I want to take the opportunity. Again, we still have to test all things, but prelimin uh, we, one way by which we can test that is by looking at the book of Revelation. And so let's go ahead and test this idea that the Feast of Trumpets corresponds to the rapture by looking at Revelation 11, verse 3. This is what it says. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, when we read this passage and we have no understanding of the Hebrew idioms, right, we probably might miss this because Yahusha, when he was speaking to Apostle John, 
and he wrote about the two witnesses, it may involve, it could be, I'm not saying and affirming anything, but there may be the possibility that the re reference to the two witnesses here could represent the two witnesses who announced Yom Teruah. And so these witnesses here, these two witnesses, their work could announce the rapture. Could that be a possibility? Could be. Let's test it. Is it okay if we test it? Let's find out. So there are two witnesses who are going to be empowered by Yahuwah, and because of the power uh, given them, they're going to testify and preach the gospel. They're going to testify of our king, Yahusha. And after their testimony, what happened? Revelation 11, 7 and 10. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will cut, will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. And so here, after the work of the two witnesses, what happens to them? They get killed by the beast. And for three and a half days, the nations see their dead bodies because they're not allowed to be buried and those who dwell on the earth bible says they were rejoicing right over the death of these two witnesses and after that what happened next 14 11 14 now after the three and a half days the breath of life from god entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And so here are the two witnesses, right? They preach the gospel. They're killed by the beast, and after three and a half days, what happens to them? They resurrect. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were alive during that time, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of TV coverage, CNN, ESPN, maybe not ESPN, but uh, CNN, Fox News maybe, right? They're going to have coverage of these two witnesses being put to death and then resurrected, and then what happens to them? What does the Bible say? They ascended to heaven. Question, the word ascended there, is that harpazo? No, it's not. It's a slow ascension. And so people see them. This is not a harpazo. When you look at the Greek word for that, it's not harpazo. The two witnesses ascend to heaven. And after they ascend to heaven, there was an earthquake. And the people became afraid. And it had a good result. What was that good result? They gave glory to Yahuwah Alehi. You notice that? Right? But there's no harpazo yet. And so after these two witnesses, and we know in the first century, two witnesses were to give their testimony that will signal the celebration of Yom Teruah. Here we have the work of two witnesses, and they die and then resurrect and go to heaven. And so the work is done, right? What happens next? Watch 15. 15 is what it says. Then the seventh angel sounded. What is that? That's a trumpet. Because this is the seventh trumpet, which is the last of seven trumpets. Could that be significant? Could be. Right? This is like the last trumpet of the seven trumpets. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. And so when the seventh trumpet is sounded, 
the last trumpet is sounded in the seven trumpets that was held by the seven angels. When the last trumpet sounded after the two witnesses ascended to heaven, there was an opening in heaven, right? The, the temple of God in heaven opened. I wonder what for. I wonder what happened. Why was the, uh, all of a sudden the temple of God was open in heaven? Well, what event takes place next? It's Revelation 12, right? What happened then? Revelation 12, 5, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Here, we have an event. It says here, a child was snatched up to God and to his throne. You know that word snatched up in Greek, what do you think it is? Yeah, it is our pazzo. This is why this Revelation 12, 5 event is a harpazo event. And so the child was snatched up. Is this child referring to Yahusha? Could be. Could be. Right? But when we look at Yahusha, when we look at this event, Yahusha ascended. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, when Yahushua went up to heaven, he wasn't harpazo to heaven. He ascended to heaven, just like the two witnesses. Here, the word harpazo is used for the first time in the book of Revelation. Not only that, the only time, the only time the word harpazo is used in Revelation is in Revelation chapter 12 in the verses 5. I find that interesting. And so when we look at Revelation 12, 5, when you read verse 5, it says, she gave birth to a son. She is referring to Israel. Israel gives birth to a male child. And then in the next sentence, instead of using male child, a different Greek word is used, her child. And you notice the descriptor that this child, together with uh, the, the male child and the child, will, be, will rule with an iron scepter. Where have we heard that before? Yahushua. When he returns, he will rule with an iron scepter together with the overcomers, right? Together with those who belong to the assembly. And so it's possible in the first mentioning of the child, it's referring to Yahusha. In the next mentioning of the child, it refers to those who belong to Yahusha, the body of Yahusha, who will be harpazoed into heaven because this is the only time harpazo is used in all of the book of Revelation. And so this all takes place after the testimony of how many witnesses? Two, after the blowing of the last trumpet. Is that coincidence? Probably not. This is why there's a lot of evidence in the Bible that the Feast of Trumpets corresponds to the event when Yahusha takes the ecclesia to heaven. Make sense? Now let's go to the Day of Atonement, which is called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So the Day of Atonement is set off like what we already mentioned with the blowing of trumpets. And so in Israel, when the blowing of trumpets takes place to signify the Feast of Trumpets, do you know what the people of Israel do? What they do is they repent because after the Feast of Trumpets, the 10 days of awe, this is what they call it, or the 10 days of repentance, it begins. So the people can prepare themselves for God's judgment on the Day of Atonement. So the people of Israel, that's what they believe. When the trumpet is blown, it's time for them to repent. For how long? 10 days. 10 days. They have to afflict their souls because when they are not prepared for this day of judgment, then they're going to be, if they're not afflicted in their soul, on that day they'll be cut off from his people. And this is why when it comes to the day of atonement, they have to repent and afflict their souls. If not, they're going to be judged, and their judge are cut off from among the people of Yahuwah Allahim. This is why they call it the day of judgment. Well, when will our King Yahushua come and fulfill this work of judgment? Well, we know in the book of Revelation 19, 11, 16, 
Now I saw heaven opened. Remember when the Bible mentioned heaven opened or the temple of heaven opened? It was the rapture or the harpazo. There the heaven opens again, right? Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with an rod of iron. Remember that? He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who is that? Yahushua. And so the Bible says there's going to be the heavens opening. The heaven opens so that Yahushua, together with the heavenly army, can come down. Where are they going to go? To earth to execute judgment and make war. Doesn't that sound like a perfect connection with the Day of Atonement, which is the day when Yahusha will judge. And so when Yahusha returns to earth at his second coming, he is going to judge. He will judge all the nations, including and specifically which nation? Israel. And so what does the Bible speak about? Let's read Zechariah 12, 10 to 14. I will pour out in the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day, there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadad, Ramon, and the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself the family of the house of david by itself and their wives by themselves the family of the house of nathan by itself and their wives by themselves the family of the house of levi by itself and their wives by themselves the family of the Shimeites by itself and their wives by themselves all the families that remain every family by itself and their wives by themselves it's interesting because what we find here is like national repentance, right? It's like all the different tribes of Israel, they are mourning and repenting. And what are they repenting about? Bible says they look on him whom they have pierced. Who is that? Our King Yahushua. I believe what led them, okay, what led Israel which is what is being spoken of here, what leads them to mourning, what leads them to repentance was when Ram Yom, Yom Teruah, or when the trumpets were blown. And then all of a sudden, there's this rapture. I don't know about you. If the rapture happened, and Yahusha appears in the sky, and all these people are gone, saved, and you're left behind, what are you going to feel? What are you going to think of? Wait a minute. Maybe the one that we killed, the one that we pierced, maybe he is the Messiah. And so what do they do? After the trumpet was blown, the rapture takes place, they're left behind. What do they do? They repent. They mourn. And so what do they do? They begin to accept Yahushua as their Messiah, that he is the one who comes in the name of Yahuwah. Because the first time he introduced himself, what did they do to him? Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahuwah. Yahusha himself said when he was speaking to Israel, to Jerusalem, right? But he's not going to come back. He's not going to return until they confess. 
until they return to Yahusha and say, Yahusha, he is the one who comes in the name of Yahuwah. When does that happen? That happens when they see the rapture, when they realize that the one they pierce is Yahusha, so they repent, return to the king, and that's when they call on him as their king and high priest. And so that begins Yahusha's return. Because Yahusha says he will not return until they will accept him as their Messiah. And so he returns to execute judgment. For those who do not accept him as Messiah, what will happen to them? They will perish, right? But for those who repent, when he returns for judgment, then they will prosper. This is why in Romans 11, 25 to 26, it says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. And so when Yahushua comes to judge, he's going to judge the nations, including Israel, but those who are repentant among Israel, Yahushua will gather them together, and we know where this is going to take place, right? So what we have on the Day of Atonement, that's when Yahushua comes to judge all the nations, including Israel. But there's a great portion of Israel, all those tribes, who will look to him and make him king, Messiah, and high priest. And so this takes us to the Feast of Tabernacles, right? The 15th day of the seventh month. And so what happens on Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles? Leviticus 23, 33, 35. Then Yahusha, Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, I Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. For seven days to Yahuwah. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. And so when is the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated? On the 15th. So the blowing of trumpets, all the three last festivals, they all happen on the same month, the seventh month, right? The seventh month on three different occasions. The first of the seventh month, the tenth of the seventh month, and then the fifteenth of the seventh month. And so what happens on the Feast of Tabernacles? Let's continue reading. Also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month. When you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of Yahuwah for seven days. It's a feast for seven days. You know, in our study next week, we're going to learn about a feast that lasts seven days. Could there be a connection? There could be. This is why we want you to listen to next week's episode of the DHV. On the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the first the, the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before Yahuwah your God for seven days. This is going to be a, a day of rejoicing. It's like when you have a marriage. You know, the happiest times in Israel is when there's a bride and a groom, and when there's a happy marriage. Whenever there's a happy marriage, people of Israel, they celebrate for seven days. It's a happy occasion. Okay? And so the day of Tab the festival of tabernacles seemed to point to a celebration. What kind of celebration? Let's read Deuteronomy 16. You must observe the festival of shelters. That's also another name for the festival of tabernacles. For seven days at the end of the harvest season, after the grain has been fresh and the grapes have been pressed. This festival will be a happy time of celebrating with your sons and daughters your male and female servants and the Levites, foreigners, orphans, and widows from your towns. For seven days, you must celebrate this festival to honor Yahuwah, your God, at the place he chooses. For it is he who blesses you with bountiful harvest and gives you success in all your work. This festival will be a time of great joy for all. Again, there's this description of joy and happiness for seven days. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. Will there be a celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles in the future? Let's go to Zechariah 14, 16 and 19. 
and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, this is the, we believe this is the, the battle of Armageddon when Yahushua returns and he destroys the kings from the east on the day of Armageddon and the nations are destroyed, those who fought against Yahushua and those against Jerusalem. The Bible says, those who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahuwah of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahuwah of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which Yahuwah strikes the nations who do not come up to, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, the punishment of all the nations that do not keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so this event, the Bible is speaking about where the people are to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And if not, they're going to be punished by Yahuwah. When is that going to take place? The Millennial Kingdom. In the millennial kingdom, when you read the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel, it is a time of joy, a time of gladness, a time of prosperity for the people of Israel. This is why when we look at the Feast of Tabernacle celebration, it points to the work of Yahusha when and after he returns to judge, and after he judges, he will establish the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. And so when we look at the festivals of Yahuwah in the fall, in the seventh month, we see that Yahushua will do something on those appointed times or Moedim. Yahushua will take his ecclesia to heaven. What do we call that? Rapture. And he will come down from heaven together with the ecclesia and he will execute judgment. And after all the kingdoms have been overthrown, there's only going to be one kingdom. What is that? Yahushua's kingdom, which he establishes on the Feast of Tabernacles. Why do we believe this? Because Yahushua observed the first four. He followed the first four. He did something in the first four. And so it's highly likely, it's highly likely, right, that he's also going to follow the timetable given by Yahuwah, the Moedim, or the appointed time when it comes to the future events that we are hoping for. And so one of the most glaring weaknesses of the pre, the mid, pre-wrath tribulation, wrath reviews is the belief, right, that there's no biblical evidence that the rapture and second coming are two distinct events. Do you think that's true? Probably not. Remember the four rapture views and the post-trib view is the only one that believes the second coming and the rapture are it's one event the pre-trib view mid-trib view pre-wrath view they all believe that the second coming and the rapture are two distinct events and so when we look at it from the Moedim point of view the appointed times we know that the second coming of Yahushua has how many events three there are three phases in the second coming of Yahusha. The first one is the rapture, the taking of the ecclesia to heaven. Number two is Yahusha's return to earth to execute judgment. And number three, Yahusha's rule as the king in the millennial kingdom. And so when we look at the Moedim, and because Yahusha fulfilled the Moedim with regards to the first, first uh, four festivals, we can assume with confidence, really. Of course, we're not certain because none of this happened yet, right? But with great certainty, we can assume that Yahusha will also follow the Moedim for the last three festivals. Is that a reasonable assumption to make? I think so. I think there's biblical evidence for that. That being the case, we can see that there are two distinct events for the rapture and the second coming because there are two distinct feasts, the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Make sense? This is why we can cross out the post-trib rapture view. 
And so this leaves us with pre-trib, mid-trib, and pre-wrath view. So there's something else I want you to notice. When we look at the Moedim and how Yahushua followed the Moedim, when you look at the first four feasts, or well, maybe just the first three feasts, they all happen in succession in the same month, in the same year. Am I right? Right? And so all that happened in just a matter of months. Matter of months, not years. Yahushua did not fulfill the 14th and then fulfill the 15th the year after, or three years after, but the same year. You get what I'm trying to say? So the first three festivals was fulfilled within days of each other, right? And then 50 days later, the day of, uh, Feast of, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. In other words, it all happened the same year. And so if that's the case, when we look at the last three feasts, it all happens in one, how many months? One month. We look at the Feast of Trumpets. What is blown? There's a rapture. Well, maybe on the 10th day, nine days later, we can expect Yahushua to return. And on the 15th, establish the millennial kingdom, right? I mean, if we're going to follow the logic in the first four feasts, then perhaps this is also applicable in the succeeding rest of the festivals that fall on the seventh month, right? And so if that's the case, if that's the case, then we can rule out the pre-trib view, because if it's pre-trib, then they're like seven years span of time between the first fest, the, uh, the uh, Day of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. You get it? It's like seven years in between, right? And so we can cross out pre-trib. Mid-trib, there's 3.5 years in between. So we can cross that out. There's a possibility for pre-wrath. There's a big problem with pre-wrath. Do you remember when the rapture takes place according to pre-wrath views? It takes place at the end of the sixth seal, right? Before the preaching of the two, Witnesses, wait a minute, it doesn't seem to fall into place, does it, right? Because according to pre-wrath, the rapture comes, and then the, uh, no, according to pre-wrath, the, uh, the rapture comes, and then the two witnesses come. But according to the Moedim, the two witnesses come first, and then the rapture. And so based on that, you can probably rule out pre-wrath. Right? And so what are we left with? Well, we have to search now the scripture so that we can confirm or deny. So that's what we're going to do in the next episodes of BHP. We're going to test it out because if it's true that the Moedim, the fall Moedim, the Moedim of the seventh month follows in succession of each other on the same year, then we can basically say that the events in the first six seals and many of the uh, of and many of the events of the seventh seal I should say many of the events of the seventh seal have already been fulfilled so if that's the case we have to test it and that's what we're going to do we're going to test it one by one we'll look at the events see whether or not they happen in history already and we will look at the events that are not yet taking place but it's going to happen right before Two witnesses will come, okay? So that's what we're going to test in our future episodes of the BHP. Why do we need to know the Moedim? Well, according to Apostle Paul, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a... Thief, you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Also, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, this is after 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Remember what happens in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16? What event was that? That was the harpazo. This is the continuation of that verse. After the harpazo was preached by Apostle Paul, he says concerning the times and the seasons. What is Apostle Paul talking about? 
the festivals, the Moedim, the appointed times. He's talking about that. Because the rapture and the second, uh, second coming, they all follow Moedim. This is why for those in the light, those who understand the Moedim, the day of the Lord will not come to them as a thief in the night. And so if we understand Moedim, what must we do? We must watch and be sober. And this is also what is said by our King Yahusha in the final passage of our studies today. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on, on those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This is what we want to happen. And so we need to take heed to ourselves. We need to be watchful because for those who are watchful, the day will not come unexpectedly. The day will only come unexpected, unexpectedly for those who do not watch, those who do not know the times and the seasons. But we know the times and the seasons. We may not know the exact day and hour, right? But we know it's related to Yom Teruah. And that will lead to the Day of Atonement, which leads to the Day of Tabern the Feast of Tabernacles, which correspond to the Rapture, the Second Coming, and then the celebration in the Millennial Kingdom. It all falls into place. The Moedi, those, that is uh, Yahuwah's timeline that Yahusha follows. And as Yahusha follows that timeline, redemptive history is being fulfilled until finally we celebrate, not just in the millennial kingdom, but eventually we will go to heaven to be with Yahuwah and Yahusha forevermore. This is our lesson. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Everlasting Abba, yes, Yahuwah Almighty, yes, your people are filled with joy. Because there's so much that we hope for. Yes. There are better days ahead. Yes. We know that it is going to come soon. Yes. That you will soon send forth your beloved son. Yes. That we can receive the promised everlasting life. Amen. Please help us to endure until the end. Yes. Help us to be watchful. Help us to understand the Moedim. Help yes. us to also share our faith that many more can be embraced by your promises. Amen. Our King Yahushua, we know you long for that day yes. when you will leave heaven and be with us to gather us together that we can be with you forevermore. Amen. Help us to endure until the end yes. and to fix our eyes upon you yes. that our faith can be perfected. Amen. Father, thank you for listening to our prayers. Yes. We ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, thank you for attending our Bible study for tonight. If you have any questions, please submit them to info at assemblyyahusha.org. And also, we just want to remind everyone concerning our event for July 23. We are excited because from what we are hearing, there's a lot of people planning to go there. So we're going to see a lot of uh, brothers and sisters in the faith. We're going to have some fellowship time. We have two events, so consider this uh, an all the affair. 10 a.m. is our special worship service, and 5 p.m. we're going to have a special study concerning the name of our King Yahusha. And we do hope that we can bring our fellow men uh, to this event so that they will kind of get an understanding of why we use the name Yahusha instead of the more common name uh, Jesus. Uh, that is all. Yahuwah Abba and Yahusha Hamashiach. Bless.